campaign that seeks to persuade a significant organization to change what it does and the way it uh, makes decisions about its resources and its income uh, involves engaging with a significant uh, political economy. And one needs to recognize that, I think, when determining the way forward. Therefore, I'm going to say very little about the human rights aspect because I think the case is well established. It's been uh, touched on already tonight. I will say a few words about that. But I really want to talk about leadership uh, and about, to some extent, strategy and particularly about the process going forward, about the way in which this campaign would need to think about how to engage with the issues and win the argument. So first of all, on, on the human rights aspect, um, I think, uh, as Professor New has already pointed out, and as others have touched upon, climate change presents a very significant threat to everybody, but it hits the most vulnerable the hardest. And therefore, it is about issues of equity and social justice. It represents a threat to economic development. Uh, and as this continent begins to develop and grow in, in <coughs> times positive ways, at other times not so positive ways, there's absolutely no doubt that climate change is a threat to the positive trajectory. There's a, there is, of course, a, a great deal of hyperbole attached to the Africa rising narrative, but for those of us who do have the privilege of working around this continent, there are positive things happening. Climate change is a threat to, to those positive things, and as I say, the, the, the dangers are that human development opportunities will be uh, missed because of a failure to grapple with climate change. Why is it a leadership issue? It's a leadership issue for two reasons, I think. First of all, those of us who have been working on, on climate change since they've been involved in for a long time, I think have come to the realization that this is not a, an issue where there is a shortage of knowledge or a shortage of money. What there is is a shortage of will to do the right thing. We know what the problem is. There is enough knowledge to understand the problem. It's a problem of scale, of an interdependency and complexity and urgency. But the nature of that problem and the nature of the solution is now well established. We know how to solve the problem and we know how to fix it in terms of the finances. It's just a question of making the right decisions to do so. Secondly, it's a, a leadership issue for a university such as UCT, because universities, to my mind, have a responsibility to lead. They have a responsibility to lead because they have the intellectual horsepower, because they have the convening power, because they have a particular position and status even in the community, because they have the responsibility to teach and to research. And so a university that uh, has that knowledge and has the ability to shine the light in the crevices of these difficult issues has, in my view, a responsibility to act in a way that is consistent and which is, uh, which is uh, not hypocritical. Now, it seems to me there's a grave danger that UCT, in making the advances that it does, in setting good standards in terms of sustainable conduct, sustainable behavior, in terms of the leadership shown on, on research and knowledge, <coughs> runs a risk that its reputation will be sorely undermined were it to continue to invest in or be associated with uh, fossil fuel uh, industries. That then uh, begs the question, uh, what is the intelligent <coughs> thing to do? A university is a receptacle of knowledge and intelligence. What is the intelligent, smart thing for a university to do in these circumstances? That, I think, is the question we have to pose. And that takes us then to, to strategy. What's the smart thing to do, not just the intelligent thing to do? And on strategy, it's absolutely clear if one, one does even a, a cursory bit of research that universities throughout the world, as David says, are being put under a great deal of pressure now to change the way in which they uh, relate to the fossil fuel industry. There is a grave danger that UCT will find itself behind the trajectory of change, will find itself not being a leader but being a laggard, following instead of leading, Others will move further and faster, and so UCT will look rather weak and unprincipled if it fails to act uh, fast. There are plenty of people watching this space. If you look at organizations like Carbon Tracker, plenty of organizations that monitor and watch 
where significant institutions are investing and where they get their money. So there's actually no doubt that social pressure in the end will tell in terms of UCT's uh, investment profile. The knowledge will be there. It's really a question of whether the university wishes to uh, be proactive in taking steps to, 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 to counter that, that pressure, or whether it simply wishes to wait until it has to, no alternative uh, but to move. In other words, the choice is one of being principled and acting voluntarily, as opposed to waiting and acting proactively, having been put in a position where it has no real alternative. And that strikes me as an issue of not just a principle, but a strategy that the leadership of this organization will have to uh, take. Lastly, on process, two or three uh, brief points. Firstly, it seems that the call for transparency is an absolutely appropriate one, that the university should be encouraged. I don't know, David, to what extent you and others feel that enough is known about the extent of, of uh, donations, extent of investments, pension fund investments, and so on. A wide range of uh, possibilities, it seems to me, uh, exist in terms of the relationship between the ECT and the fossil fuel industry. So the first thing is to find out what is, what is there and determine the extent of the issue. Uh, and secondly, then, to grapple with potential conflicts of interest and the extent to which the university may have already put itself in positions where it is associated with or connected with investments which run counter to the knowledge and understanding of the problem that it itself is generating. Because it seems to me that would be a, a very unfortunate uh, and awkward position to be in. So identifying those conflicts of interest would be a very important uh, second point. Thirdly, to uh, preempt the argument that may come that divestment is simply not viable from an economic point of view. The university has to be financially sustainable and that to divest would be uh, financially uh, precarious or perilous thing to do. Well, again, there is so much evidence out there, again, it's been touched on, to suggest that uh, divestment away from fossil fuels, for example, to renewables, may not be an economically uh, improved thing to do. On the country, as Standard & Poor's Paul suggests, it may in fact be a wise <coughs> financial strategy. So I think it's very important to engage with that and to marshal the evidence and information in order to be able to uh, tackle that particular argument. Lastly, and this is addressed really to the student members of the audience, in the end, um, you are the consumers, I hate to use that word, but you are, you're the consumers of the products and services and knowledge generation of this university. And it's for you, I think, to demand what you want. Uh, you're younger than the people, most of you, that, that uh, teach you, and it's for you to demand the future that you want and to demand that the university plays its role and meets its responsibility, social and academic, in establishing a future that is safer, secure, and which respects the human rights of all the citizens of this world. Thank you.